Um, I, I now would like to introduce the final speaker on this panel, uh, Dr. Albert Wang. Uh, Dr. Wang is Professor of Medicine, the Director of the Center for Chronic Disease Research and Policy, and an Associate Director of the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translational Research uh, here at the university. Previously, Dr. Wang served as a Senior Advisor in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation in the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, Dr. Wang's research focuses on issues at the intersection of aging, diabetes, and health economics. He's received numerous awards for his work, including the Research Paper of the Year from the Society of General Internal Medicine and an elected membership in the American Society for Clinical Investigation. Today, uh, Dr. Albert Wang will present a talk entitled, as you see behind me, The Science and Ethics of Medicine, the Intensive Please join me in welcoming Dr. Albert Wang. Can you hear me? Is that loud enough? Um, thank you again for having me um, at this, um, this amazing annual conference. Uh, it's quite a, a network of, uh, quite a social network you've created, Mark. Um, so I, um, I hope this is coherent. Um, so uh, I'll start with um, a question, how did we get here? And I'll just explain what this graphic shows. This is a, a gra uh, international study looking at the uh, proportion of older people, over 65, who are taking more than five medications. That's the definition of polypharmacy. And on the x-axis is the years, and on the y is the proportion of people. Um, so just to, um, uh, to put a point on it, so uh, the, and these are from individual studies. So for the, you look at the study from Craftman, from Sweden, uh, the rate of polypharmacy as they define it has risen from 20, uh, 22% to now 60% by, uh, from, 19, from the uh, 1980s to 2005. Um, and the pattern you'll see across all countries is that, is that the number of people taking more than five medications is, is, uh, is uniform across, it's, it's, it's an international phenomenon across all, the country, all countries. Um, I think actually the H, is a study from our own National Social Health and Aging Project. Uh, I think it's a study from Dima Cato. Uh, that's the H. That also shows the rise from 2005 to 2010. So why is this happening? Why are, we, why are more older people taking more medications? Um, there are at least two major reasons that have been proposed. Uh, one is that the, there are more indication, there are more drugs to prescribe, and there are more indications to prescribe those drugs. Um, and part of the, what fuels this also is that to this day, the uh, different societies for different dis medical disciplines um, have actually splintered into even more subgroups, and they each write their own clinical practice guidelines. Everyone's practicing their own kind of medicine in their own small discipline. It's easier to control your world if you just study your, if you just treat one condition. And so no one thinks about the, uh, the, uh, the consequence of all these guidelines and all these recommendations and new drugs. The consequence is polypharmacy. So who's, watch, who's, who's monitoring polypharmacy? It's the dwindling number of primary care doctors like myself who, are able, who, uh, who actually don't have much time to even reconcile all the meds that um, are being prescribed. So um, another uh, strong, another, a second uh, reason that this may be happening is that we may be actually just being more successful in keeping people alive for longer. So we are doing a really good job. Um, and maybe, maybe it's due to some of these medications. So part of it is also uh, we are a greater success in, in maintaining longevity in our populations is, is leading to this overall higher rate of polypharmacy. So why would we mess with a good thing like all these medications? Um, so um, there are some, on the left are just some ideas that, um, that I think that, that many people would, would uh, share, which is that, you know, one reason to reduce uh, prescribing a medication, a de-intensify, or to lessen the number of medications a person's taking is to reduce the harms of those medications, potentially reduce the harms, uh, the risk of drug-drug interactions in particular. Another possibility, uh, which is more controversial, is that maybe some of these medications, while they may not cause harm, they're not doing any good either. So some medications that we prescribed in some populations are just there, we've maintained them, but they may not be producing any clear benefit to the patient. 
A third reason to consider deintensification is that life might be better. We might be able to improve quality of life by reducing the number of medications that a person takes. Um, I, um, did not have time to include pictures, but there's these classic pictures of an older person sitting in front of their, at the dining table with 20 medications. It's, it is a real, uh, a real burden to take all those medications to manage the sequence of when they have to be taken. And actually, if you've, uh, uh, I, I, I've, I've had discomfort taking a single ibuprofen. Uh, so imagine taking three or four at a time. So the, the burden of taking medications is real. Um, and, and David Meltzer, I think, is in the audience. He and I actually quantified the overall burden of uh, taking multiple medications for diabetes, and it's real. Um, and a last, uh, another idea is that um, if we took less medications, it would reduce the cost of, uh, of medications to the patient, but also to the system. So these are um, 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 uh, all reasons to de-intensify. In the uh, right-sided graphic is, um, is um, a, a, a figure that's depicting the proximity of um, all the effects of poly polypharmacy from the most proximal to the most distal. So the most proximal effects of polypharmacy are drug-drug and drug-disease interactions, adverse drug reactions. Outside of that are the events or consequences of adverse drug events such as falls. Um, and then outside of that are um, uh, loss of physical and cognitive function, frailty, and sarcopenia that could result from a, a fall due to medications. And, and finally, of course, on the outer ring of uh, the most distal effects would be, of course, uh, hospitalization and death. Um, in the, uh, for those of you who are geriatricians, um, the, you know one of the one of the uh, classic risk factors for falls is actually just taking more than four or more medications a day. Um, I did not believe this uh, association, um, uh, even though it's a it's a it's a, a long a long um, uh, it's been studied many many times in the 80s and 90s. We recapitulated the finding in the 2000s. It's a real association. The more meds you take, the more likely you are to fall. So one tricky part of this field, uh, as it, it and it's it's an it's an area of um, that is that is growing, uh, is that there actually are alternative definitions of what deintensification means to patients, to doctors, and even to reach investigators. If you if you look at the in, in the uh, now, the growing literature of deintensification trials, the de the definitions used uh, to to uh, define um, deintensification vary. They vary in terms of actually what happens to the change in the regimen, and also they vary in terms of their intended or unintended effect on the actual biomarker. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking really in the in the realm of um, of chronic disease management. So thinking about the intensification of blood pressure drugs or uh, diabetes medications and their effects on glucose. So um, in terms of change in regimen, um, you know the simplest and the the least uh, least dramatic change would be, of course, a uh, reduction in dose. Uh, the, the next um, um, the next, uh, lef next level of intensity of change in regimen would be something where we just make a switch or a ch you know a swap out a drug that is not favorable in terms of its delivery route, such as an injectable drug, for an alternative like an oral agent. So, just in, uh, lessening the intensity or the, uh, of, the of, of, of the regimen itself. And the, the most, the most, uh, the, the most uh, drastic uh, deintensification move is, of course, just to stop a medication. And I'll show you some examples of recent trials of attempts to just stop medications. Um, the intent, the consequence for biomarkers, um, you know, for many people, it means quite a different. Uh, the intensification is really different if it means that there's actually no effect on the biomarker. If I take less medicines and I'm achieving the same biomarker levels. For many people, that is actually a complete win. That, that, that is a uh, that is a win, but um, but in many cases, our recommendations for deintensification are actually to allow the biomarker to rise. That is more controversial in the minds of many patients. So um, I'm going to. This is these are the next two slides show you um, results from uh, uh, really now in the field of deintensification is going to be the, one of the first classic random large scale multi center randomized controlled trials of a, an attempt to deintensify. This comes from the field of uh, the, this comes from the Palliative Care Research Network. This is a trial led by Gene Kuttner out of Colorado, and they started with one of the simplest ideas to, of deintensification. What if we just stop the drug that has no uh, 
uh, in, in this case, they stopped statins. They took uh, a population of people who were in palliative care and who were, who were already taking a statin and said, what happens if we just ask, if we have them randomized to stopping the statin or not? And this, uh, th these curves show you the rate of, um, of more, so what they were concerned, what were, people are very concerned about is if you stop a statin which has uh, effects on the cardiovascular system and prevents heart attacks, if we stop statins, are people gonna start dying at a higher rate? Are we gonna have more cardiovascular mortality? This curve shows you overall mortality and uh, the, the um, and you can see the statin arm and the discontinuation arm and there was actually no statistical difference between. So there was no increase in deaths if we stopped statins. And this is a group of people in palliative care with a fairly short life expectancy under one year. This is what happened to quality of life. If, if the, if the uh, dot and the confidence intervals is to the left of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of zero, that means it favors the intensification arm. So this is to show you all the different ways in which quality of life improved with the intensification in this population. So from this trial, we would conclude that this, this continuation of statins in a palliative care population is beneficial, if anything, and with no harm. But just this last year, and again, this is a single trial, I don't know of uh, many others, but this is an observational study from France where they took, uh, they, they took data about people who were over 75 already taking a statin in France, and for some reason, some have stopped statins and others have continued. And in this, this is an observational study, so the reasons for why people are stopping statins may be tied to the result that we see. But in this case, what happens, they, they looked at rates of hospitalization for cardiac events. And the group that stops taking, stopped taking the statin had a, um, a higher hazard of ending up in the hospital with a cardiac event. So at least from this data, uh, this, this, this um, observational study of deintensification is not a good idea. So the two, these two results are conflicting. So I'm going to, now what is, is going to be challenging is that the, the idea about desintensification is going to be different from condition to condition and from decision to, from decision, to decision. So that was a, the simple, uh, in many ways, discontinuation of statins is a very simple idea because there is no, uh, because you just stop a single pill. Now I'm going to shift to the field of diabetes, which I work in, in a more complicated deintensification in this case could lead to poor control and actual symptoms of the actual underlying disease. So we can't simply stop medicines in this case. We have to maintain some medicines uh, in order to control the disease, but there are maybe cases where we can deintensify. This is a summary of guidelines that um, have uh, been published in the last 10 years. The ADA guideline, which you see in the middle, is one that I helped to shape. Um, and in, in this, these are guidelines for uh, diabetes in people over the age of 65. And what is, there is general consensus that we need to individualize uh, diabetes care, at least the intensity of care. Uh, it, from, for those of you who don't know, diabetes is a lot, a lot like um, uh, in, in, uh, uh, long-term planning for retirement. You have to put in your money, you have, to you have to save your money early on, you have to invest, in, and actually early on you should invest in the stock market and be aggressive, as aggressive as possible. But later in, as you uh, approach retirement, it's time to start pulling the money out and maybe move to safer investments. That's the case in diabetes care. Most of the trial data shows that it's very beneficial to intensively control sugars uh, in people in their 40s, 50s, and, and, and maybe early 60s, but the trials of people in their late 60s, 70s, and 80s have been very mixed. In fact, you may remember a landmark randomized controlled trial um, of, of diabetes care in 2008 called ACCORD had to be stopped because increased risk of death in the intensive treatment arm. Um, so uh, that has, so the, the reason for the three tiers that you'll see in the, I, I've listed uh, is basically we're, we're saying that the longer you have to live, the, the you should be pursuing lower targets and aggressive treatments, but the, the, sh the, the shorter your life expectancy is, we should be, you, using less medications and allowing the sugar to rise. This is a, uh, this is controversial. This is not fully proven in a randomized controlled trial, um, but it is based on this concept of remaining life expectancy. And actually, you'll notice that this is actually, in, 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 you've heard uh, Dr. Toll, this is uh, a research question or a clinical problem in the space between chronic disease management and end of life care. So we're in this space in between. 
So we recommended different targets for different, for, for different patients. And um, this, uh, many of these, guys, there were uh, early recommendations of this nature in 2005, and then we published these ADA guidelines in 2012. And um, uh, this is what we see in um, in data five years later in the in in the country. Basically, no one's listening to us. Um, and so this is um, uh, this is uh, an observational study from NHANES looking at um, the divides up the uh, older patients into the three tiers I described to you. And this is a a histogram of the achieved glucose levels of healthy, in, uh, complex, and, then, uh, and, poor, and older patients in poor health. There is no difference in the rates of glucose control across these. So the treatments is essentially the same. Uh, achieved glucose levels are essentially the same. And what's actually even more striking is rates of use of very aggressive medications like insulin and sulfurea are also nearly identical across every uh, class of older person. And actually, for those of you who practice uh, general medicine or primary care or endocrinology, it's actually easy to see how this happens. We don't keep track of who the per we don't know that the we don't sort the, the the older person in clinical practice into these different buckets, and we practice a lot of whack-a-mole medicine. We're just trying to deal with problems as they arise. We don't think about the long-term uh, trajectory of a disease. Um, and then this is a great study from the VA that follow, is, a, is a similar follow-up. What they asked was, in the VA, they actually remind the doctors of the health status of the patient, and they have different tiers of glucose control recommendations for these different uh, patients. And in the VA system, even though they have this automated system, there is no, um, there's essentially no uh, deintensification. The, the height of this bar is the rate of deintensification for blood pressure and for glucose uh, for uh, different patients of different levels of health status. So there, the, the overall rates of deintensification are very low and they're no different across health status. So why doesn't deintensification happen in, in clinical practice? Uh, it may be that we just don't have enough time to weigh the, the risks and benefits. It's cognitively challenging. It may be difficult to communicate with patients about this idea of taking less. Um, and it may be a legacy effect of, of the, maybe uh, about 20 years ago, we had multiple public health campaigns driving into people's brains different glucose targets, and it's hard for people to forget that. And the other challenge is that care is highly segregated. So if I want to change diabetes care and how it's delivered to older people, I have to not only convince people in uh, outpatient practices, but I have to convince the hospitalists. I have to convince the long-term care nurses who actually decide on how much medication to, to give um, for uh, for demented patients. So the system's so segregated with so many different players, you have to somehow reach all those parties and convince all of them that care needs to be changed. It creates, um, um, this idea of densification creates obviously new, uh, new dilemmas. And this is a phenomenal paper that comes from Alexi Torkey, one of the McLean Center fellows, uh, where she, at, she did um, a focus groups or, um, um, or maybe even one-on-one -on -one interviews with older people about the idea of stopping screening uh, for breast cancer or colon cancer. And some of the quotes are from this paper are just amazing. So many of the older patients, these are all, I think, older adults that came from Indianapolis. Is that right, Alexi? Um, and they said things like, I think I, sh I think uh, stopping would be the same as me taking my life, and that's a sin. So uh, the, even the idea of stopping a mammogram or, d or no longer doing colonoscopy had a lot of meaning attached to it more than we um, that more than we think. And so uh, physicians' recommendations to stop something may threaten patient trust, and most patients had limited discussions with, in this study, most patients had not spent a lot of time talking to their doctors about whether or not to continue screening. It was just assumed that we would, it was the default was just continue doing what we're doing. And uh, this is a more recent study about uh, diabetes deintensification. This is a st national study of older adults where um, these investigators from Hopkins actually uh, gave uh, patient, asked patients about what was important for them in terms of adding medications or deintensifying de medications. And they lined up what's in the guidelines with what, doc what patients thought was important. And uh, basically, patients' ideas are completely, dis are, are, for, apart from um, uh, adverse drug effects, 
effects of dr uh, uh, adverse, uh, uh, apart from side effects of drugs, there's discordance on every other idea. So um, older patients, for example, if we were asked, that, uh, when they were asked, well, uh, if, if a per person was, um, um, uh, had a longer life expectancy or a shorter life expectancy, who should have more medications? The patient said the person with shorter life expectancy should get more medicines. And then if you ask them about, um, um, uh, what if the person has complications of diabetes already or no complications? They say the person with more complications should get more medications for diabetes. So completely discordant with what we know about epidemiology and treatments of diabetes. Uh, so it's going to be very different, challenging to implement this in practice. So one idea had, we've been trying is to use shared decision making with patients. Could shared decision making help? We've tried two different trials. The most recent trial is this one, uh, My Diabetes Goal. We've basically had patients in interact with a survey and told them what the ADA recommends uh, for them. And um, uh, just as a teaser, we, this has not formally been, uh, but we, we know from anecdote from talking to the nurses that have been doing these discussions that almost every patient, if they're, if they're given a, a target, they'll pick something always lower than the target. Um, so it's another challenge that we're going to face in communication about um, this idea. So many unanswered question, questions. When is the right time to deintensify in a patient's life? What are the right clinical outcomes for de studying deintensification? If we need to do it, how do we do it? Thank you. Fabulous. Questions, please. Dr. Steven. <laughs> Oh, she was um, first. first. Oh, I'm no, sorry. let her go first. Yeah. She got to the microphone first. I, ju I jumped right up. <laughs> yeah, she did. So that, that was really interesting. Thank you. I, I just was wondering back to your discussion with the Stanton case. Now, I don't know this for sure, but I have this intuition that this, the, the study populations really seem to me to be quite different. Um, you know, and, and, and physiologically, not just with respect to their proximity to death, say. But it would seem to me a person who's uh, a candidate for palliative care would be physiologically um, m much different, uh, even uh, w with respect to, you know, you could show that on a lab works. And I was wondering if, if, there, if that was taken into account. And the reason I'm wondering that is the group who are in the 75 the 75-year-old group, um, it seems too to me, just intuitively, that uh, if a, a physician were to say to that group, like, I w we'd like to take you off the statins, but we'd like to get you physiologically sort of tuned up so that you wouldn't experience uh, adverse effects from that, so diet and exercise and stuff like that, uh, wouldn't, uh, would it be the case that those two groups would look more similar than they did the way that you presented? Uh so I think your, your observation is, I think you're absolutely right. That's, a, that's likely the difference between the French study and the, um, and the palliative care study. They're, they're probably different populations. And that gets to this question is, when is the right time, when is the right, what is the right population uh, to de-intensify in? The palliative care population had a life expectancy, life expectancy under one year. They were very, very sick. And, um, and so if you're uh, over 75 in France, who knows, you, you may be living for a another decade. So um, that's a, those are very different populations. I don't know about the nuances of, of, of <laughs> statin removal, and but yes, people frequently try to um, uh, encourage more behavior change and other other parts of life when they stop a statin. Yeah. And the willing, just one follow. Sorry, I'm sorry. But and the, and the and the and the willingness of patients not to engage in those kinds of lifestyle changes that could actually favorably uh, affect them uh, could be added to your list of why uh, just in practice. This de-escalation oh, yeah, yeah. doesn't occur. Sure. And, and the, 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 um, <clears throat> the, the French study I saw it went for four years. Yes. In contrast to the palliative care. One year. One year, right. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's a very good point because I, it seems to me that what you're really showing us is just the way we introduce and market drugs coming to kick us in the butt at the back end. Because what we do is we'll say to, that a drug reduces stroke risk, say, by 25%. So it starts at, that means it takes it from 4% to 3%, which means our number needed to treat is 400, and we do that on large population-based trials, and then we take these older folks, smaller samples run them for shorter times, and we say, well, we don't see a benefit. If we were 
honestly selling these drugs at the front end, what we'd be telling patients is that this drug, if you take this in a group of 400 people, one person is gonna have a stroke uh, prevented, but we don't start the drugs that way, and it's no surprise that when we take them away, we don't see an effect. Yeah, that's a, that, actually, that's an excellent question. So if, why do we have the deintensification uh, uh, question um, when we could actually put, potentially prevent this whole thing by doing a better job at the start? When we introduce drugs to people being more forthcoming about, uh, and actually there are tools designed to show people the, uh, the modest gains with individual drugs. So I, you're absolutely right that this, we're trying to solve a problem that's been created by um, other, other practices in medicine. Yes, please. Kind of following up on that, um, you know, I was listening to a podcast from the curbside recently about de escalating medications and also emphasizing all kind of patient care discussions in the context of, you know, number needed to treat or number needed to harm or needed to benefit and all sorts of time to benefit and time to harm. But, um, you know, I'm wondering if you have any comments on the fact that, like, it's not. Oh yeah, so uh, I'll tell you a humbling story, a hum humbling experience we have. So the personal DC trial that we did was actually a, a, a it was a, a tool that had a simulation model embedded within it that calculated the person's risk of of different complications at different different glucose levels. We thought it would, and, and actually in many cases the differences are were minuscule. So um, guess you can guess what happened when, to the intervention arm versus the control arm. The intervention patients routinely picked a lower target than their original target, even though the numbers showed no difference. Um, and it's because just the idea of being having risk displayed to them made them scared and pick something. So, and um, th there's a similar pattern happening in the ongoing trial. So there's something about numeracy, the idea of risk. So even talking about it can lead to things you don't expect. It's a really complicated area. Thank you. Albert, thanks so much.